Good afternoon. I am Jeffrey Norfleet, one of the directors of academic affairs for the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. And I would like to take this time to welcome you as we begin to um, hear from SACS COC regarding the findings from the fall 2020 survey um, institutional response to COVID-19. This webinar is hosted in conjunction with the Tennessee Accreditation Network, in which um, this afternoon you'll hear a little bit more about and find an understanding of what the Tennessee Accreditation Network is and how it is made up. But of uh, before we get started, I just want to take this time to welcome you and to give you an opportunity to state your name in the chat, your institution, and the state in which you are from. Um, we have from our registration representatives from many states that are accredited by SACS COC. And so we are excited um, to have you on board as we share regarding these SACS COC findings. And just additional housekeeping, we also would like for you to post any questions that you may have throughout the presentation. Our staff at TCAC will be monitoring the chat and we will share your questions with our presenter. And if they are not all responded to today, we will share those with the presenter and hopes to maybe post them to our website and any questions that need to be answered as well. To give you a high level overview, we will um, hear from our executive director, Dr. Emily House, to provide us greetings um, on behalf of CHAC, and then we will learn a little bit more about the TEN, the Tennessee Accreditation Network, um, from Dr. Stephanie Colich and Ms. Patty Flowers, followed by an introduction from Dr. Sherry Clavier for our presenter, who will be Dr. Alexi Madviv, Director of Training and Research of SACS COC. And then after the presentation, we'll have an additional question and answer period in which um, we will get as many questions to Dr. McBeave as possible so that he can provide feedback and anything else for um, our viewers. So again, welcome. We're excited to have you join us. This is our second webinar um, for the Tennessee Accreditation Network, and we're looking forward to sharing with you um, the resources that we have and glad to see you on and wish you the best rest of the day after the presentation. Without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. House to provide us greetings. Dr. House. Hey everybody, good afternoon. I really just wanted to say hello. It's so wonderful to see so many familiar names and I can see some faces, but not a lot of faces um, coming together to talk about this type of work, this set of parameters. Um, I will stay on the call for a while. I'm eager to hear a little bit more about the survey results run by SACS. Um, I think in as much as we all collaborate in many different areas all the time, state by state, university by university, college by college, I think when we're having these discussions about accreditation and the successes and the challenges, this is really a place in which institutions within a state and between states can really collaborate and really share experiences, best practices to make sure the lines of communication are always open and lessons learned are often shared. So I'm so thrilled just to say hi quickly, but um, so thrilled that this group is together to do just that. Um, so really that is the extent of the greetings I was hoping to bring. Thanks to Jeffrey and the academic affairs team for facilitating this meeting. Um, and I really think this is just a prime example of collaboration intrastate, interstate um, that really will serve everybody so well, especially in this space. So um, really appreciate everybody being together. Many thanks for spending your time together today. Um, in the spirit of learning and collaboration and kind of sharing of best practices and challenges and resolutions. So with that, I'll kick it back to Jeffrey and I'll be with you all for a little bit, but you all know where to find me if you need me. So. Thank you so much, Dr. House. We too appreciate you and your support that you always provide for initiatives such as this. Now, moving on, we'll turn it over to Dr. Kolich and Ms. Flowers as they will provide an overview of the Tennessee Accreditation Network and just give you a brief description of what we do and how we uh, move forward in sharing different expertise. Thank you. This is Patty Flowers. Um, this idea came about, well, we stole it. I mean, just we stole it. We, we were in a meeting and uh, somebody from the state of Virginia, I believe, was talking about their accreditation network, and Stephanie and I looked at each other and said, oh, we need to do that. Then we went to another session, and there were folks from Florida, and they were talking about their accreditation network, and again, we looked at each other and said, we need to do that. 
So we came home and approached uh, the folks at THEC and said, we need to do this. And so that's kind of how it came about. We appreciate the support of Jeffrey and Julie Roberts, and we're happy to have this up and going. Our, who we are, we're a group of accreditation liaisons and other higher ed professionals, and we want to improve academic quality, accountability, self and peer evaluation process across the state of Tennessee. Here's our mission to support accreditation efforts in Tennessee higher education institutions by sharing what we know and what we've learned. Our vision is that it will become a valuable resource for our member institutions. Our aims is to encourage and continuous improvement in quality and innovation to share our collective accreditation and assessment expertise through professional development activities like this one, networking, mentoring, sharing institutional resources to include good practices, institutional data and information, and to provide discussion forums so that we can share our knowledge and expertise. Recent listserv topics have included open positions at Tennessee institutions, mission statement reviews and approvals, and THEC SACS COC alignment of deadlines, definitions, and requirements. And Stephanie? I'm Stephanie Kolich, and um, I, I oversee the web pages for the Tennessee Accreditation Network, and you can see our web address there. We've got a bunch of resources we're adding to this all the time, and we invite you to, to look at our, our web pages, whether you're from Tennessee or not. For our Tennessee folks, we do have a listserv, and there's information on our web page for joining the listserv. And we hope that, that you will take advantage of this opportunity, and uh, especially our listserv, and add, add to the, the collective knowledge of the state. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Back to you, Jeffrey. Thank you both. Uh, and we appreciate all the hard work and the vision that you provided um, for us. And so with that being said, that is why we are here today as um, the two of you came together and helped us the Tennessee Education Commission to create this network and which we have several members and today um, Dr. Clavier from East Tennessee State University will provide us an introduction as she is one of the um, key members that is that is on the um, network and she will um, take it from here and provide us with an introduction. Dr. Clavier. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. The TAN Steering Committee began planning for this event back in February. We knew we wanted the session to focus on educational quality in the online environment, but we weren't sure exactly which content our members would find most useful. Our group had a number of excellent suggestions for both topics and speakers. As a part of that process, I suggested we reach out to the research and training folks at SAC COC to see if they could share the findings from the COVID-19 survey that was conducted in fall of 2020. Probably like many of you on this call, I've attended Dr. Montvive's sessions at SAC COC annual meetings and the Summer Institutes for years, and I've always found them extremely valuable. We reached out to Dr. Montvive, and thankfully he agreed to share with our group today. Dr. Alexi Matbeev currently serves as the Director of Training and Research at SACS COC, where he's worked since 2012. Prior to joining the Commission, Dr. Matbeev served as Associate Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Assessment, Director of the Quality Enhancement Plan, and as an adjunct faculty member at Norfolk State University. He also worked as an instructor and assistant dean at Udmurt State University in Russia and is an adjunct instructor at the College of William and Mary. Dr. Matviev earned an undergraduate degree in philology and education from Udmurt State, an MED in educational administration and organizational development from Kent State University, an MA in economic sociology jointly offered by Central European University and Lancaster University, and a PhD in higher education administration from the College of William and Mary. 
Dr. Matt Beebe has published in several journals and conducted sessions at numerous professional meetings on topics related to assessment, accreditation, curriculum mapping, and student completion. After reading his biographical sketch, I realized why I have always found Dr. Matt Beebe's sessions to be so helpful. He is one of us. I look forward to learning more from him about how our colleagues at other SAC COC institutions have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alexi Matveev. Thank you, Dr. Clavier, uh, and good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, before I start uh, my, my presentation, first of all, I, I know that many of you in the audience were instrumental in collecting information to respond to the sex COC COVID survey last fall. So please accept sincere thanks from the commission staff for documenting the actions that your institutions took in response to the pandemic. And that's for helping us to, to better understand how we at sex COC can uh, support the membership uh, in these challenging times. As you might remember, the survey questionnaire uh, that we administered last fall was intentionally quite comprehensive in scope and sought institutional feedback uh, on the pandemic's impact in various uh, instructional, student support, and operational uh, functions. Overall, uh, we received responses from more than 490 institutions, 493. This is approximately 63% response rate, which is not exceptional, but is quite good uh, for this type of uh, survey projects. Respondents uh, rep represented a broad cross-section of the diverse uh, sex COC institutional uh, membership. Out of these 490 respondent schools, we had 39 institutions from the great state of uh, Tennessee. A couple of general notes. Um, first, please remember the data we will review this afternoon represents uh, a fall 2020 snapshot of rapidly changing uh, situation on campuses. Uh, second, uh, for this overview, uh, we take an overall commission-wide uh, perspective. And third, uh, given the limited time for this uh, session, I will outline on the selected key findings from this comprehensive survey. Specifically, I will highlight findings related to major actions taken in key function areas in response to COVID, estimated impact of the pandemic on major operational measures, and most pressing current challenges and future projections. But before we dive into the survey data, let's establish some context. A dramatic expansion of online instruction was the single largest action that schools had to take in response to the pandemic. But what was the scope of distance education on campuses before COVID? This piece of information is important to consider to understand the true scope and scale of the pandemic's impact on college operations. So drawing on iPads data as of uh, fall 2019, uh, on average, about a quarter of students in sac schools were enrolled in some distance education courses. And another fifth or so were exclusively enrolled in distance ed. For institutions in Tennessee, the numbers are slightly lower, but quite comparable to the overall sac COC membership. So as you can see, on average, more than a third of students were exposed to at least some online teaching and learning modalities before the pandemic. Oops. 
first, let's quickly review what was happening last spring, spring uh, 2020, uh, when COVID attacked the world. The majority uh, of respondent institutions were either closed for everyone, 9%, or open for essential employees only, 54%. Another 11% allowed non-essential employees on campus, but not students. So in other words, three quarters of institutions were completely closed for students last spring. But a quarter of schools had some generally small uh, groups of students on campus. Primarily, these were international students, students who relied on campus housing, and students enrolled in some clinicals, uh, some practica and technical uh, courses. Tennessee institutions uh, took a slightly um, more cautious approach than the SAC COC overall membership, with only 18% of schools allowing some groups of students on campuses in spring 2020. As most schools were closed for any physical presence of students on campuses, it is not surprising that in March to May of last year, an overwhelming majority of coursework, 95%, 96%, uh, was delivered through the distance education only uh, methods. Uh, only a fraction uh, of course sections were offered uh, in hybrid or in-person only uh, modalities. And uh, as you can see, uh, instructional delivery modes in Tennessee institutions uh, closely reflected the overall SAC COC membership. By the middle uh, of the uh, next uh, uh, semester, the fall uh, 2020 semester, uh, the situation with campus openings changed uh, substantially. Just 5% of respondent institutions uh, remained either fully or partially closed, with no students allowed on campus. Uh, almost 40% of institutions reopened for uh, all uh, employees as well as some uh, groups of students, for example, freshman class or graduate students. But more than half, 55% uh, of institutions reopened fully for all employees and all students. In other words, in fall 2020, almost all uh, institutions had at least some groups of students uh, on campus. Interestingly, uh, while in spring 2020, Tennessee schools were slightly more cautious regarding students on campuses than the overall SAC COC membership, in fall 2020, then Tennessee institutions were a bit more dynamic in fully opening their campuses to students, with 59% of schools open uh, to all students in Tennessee versus, to, uh, versus 55% uh, in the overall uh, membership. In terms of instructional activities, it is interesting to note that although most institutions have uh, either fully or partially uh, reopened for students in fall 2020, uh, half of course uh, sections continue to be offered through distance education only delivery modes. About a third of courses adopted a hybrid design and just 20% of course sections were taught fully in person as of last uh, fall. And as you can see, distribution of instructional delivery modes in Tennessee uh, institutions last semester was essentially identical to the SAC COC overall membership. Now, uh, we will take a look at actions that institutions commonly uh, took in response to COVID. 
this summary information is based on the analysis of comments uh, provided to open-ended survey items. And let's start with uh, teaching and learning. Not surprisingly, the most common uh, task here was to redesign courses for virtual or hybrid delivery while quickly developing or refreshing faculty expertise in online pedagogies. Further, uh, we all know that deans and registrars had to employ very creative approaches to course scheduling. And in, in addition, uh, sizes of many classes had to be modified with face-to-face -face class sizes reduced to accommodate social distancing re requirements while online classes growing in size. Another uh, frequently mentioned uh, item in this area was providing students and faculty with loaner laptops and other equipment to facilitate online or hybrid teaching and learning. Finally, uh, in this area, on a related note, uh, many classrooms had to be reconfigured uh, to meet social distancing guidelines and uh, had to be refurbished to facilitate uh, hybrid instruction. In the area of educational policies, uh, in spring 2020, many institutions modified course grading schemes most commonly allowing pass-fail option instead of letter grades. Further, uh, many schools waived standardized test admission requirements. And in some institutions, th this temporary adjustment becomes a permanent policy as we move in the future. And it will be interesting to see what effect, if any, test optional admission uh, will have on student uh, achievement and success. Also, uh, a large number of respondents reported that their institutions condensed academic calendars for the fall 2020 semester by removing fall breaks and concluding instructional activities by Thanksgiving. Finally, on many campuses, academic ceremonies such as commencement or graduation were conducted virtually or were canceled or scaled uh, down. Two general themes uh, emerged uh, in the area of academic and student support uh, services. First, uh, on many campuses, student services fully or partially moved to the virtual settings. With some programs adopting online meeting platforms, such as, uh, for example, utilizing Zoom for advising sessions, and some using specialized, specialized services, such as online writing studios for peer tutoring, uh, for example. Ensuring social distancing uh, was a second major uh, theme that emerged in this particular area. Many respondents uh, discuss reconfiguring and controlling capacity of dining and residence halls, libraries, and common uh, study areas. Respondents also noted that many support services now require advanced scheduling, for example, for advising appointments, or advanced ordering, uh, for example, uh, curbside pickup uh, of books from libraries. In addition, many schools extended office hours uh, to support, uh, uh, to accommodate social uh, distancing as well as uh, a synchronous nature of virtual learning uh, processes. Further, a number of respondents noted that the institutions had to develop special policies to enforce social distancing rules. And finally, schools frequently uh, suspended some athletics programs and many uh, student activities uh, events. An institution's ability to manage the spread of COVID uh, was uh, one of the key factors determining 
whether and to what extent campuses were open to students and staff. This chart uh, shows uh, whether respondent institutions required commonly utilized containment measures as of last fall, fall 2020. You can see that almost all schools, uh, sex services schools, uh, required social distancing and required masks. COVID symptom screening, uh, contact tracing and training on health guidelines were also commonly required. In contrast, uh, less than half of respondent schools required informed consent agreements or similar forms, and only one fifth uh, of sex COC institutions required COVID testing uh, last uh, semester. Requirements related to social distancing, masks, and consent agreements in Tennessee institutions were identical to the overall sex COC membership. However, uh, the survey data suggests uh, that uh, last fall, Tennessee schools tended to be a bit less forceful in requiring COVID symptom checking, contact tracing, and especially uh, testing. At this uh, moment, uh, let's uh, take a pause uh, and see if there are any questions. Because we're monitoring the chat, we don't have any right now, but we will keep track just in case. All right, so let's then uh, move. Uh, to the next part, and in this section, we'll explore estimated impact of the pandemic on some key uh, operational uh, measures. We will start with enrollment, uh, uh, with the student enrollment. Despite some dire predictions of plummeting enrollments that were made last uh, spring and summer, as you can see, uh, more than a third of sex COC respondents, 37%, reported that their institutions had not experienced any declines in student numbers in fall 2020. In fact, uh, some institutions indicated that the enrollments had actually increased in fall 2020 compared to 2019. At the same time, uh, about 40% of schools experienced uh, small to moderate enrollment declines uh, of less than 10%. 20% uh, of schools uh, reported decline between 1 and 4%, another 20% or so reported decline between 5 and 10%. However, uh, as we can see, in about one fifth of sex COC institutions, enrollment dropped quite significantly, more than 10%. Uh, if we compare uh, Tennessee to the overall uh, sex COC uh, membership, uh, we can see that Tennessee institutions estimated slightly smaller pandemic related student enrollment declines than the sex COC overall membership. It is critically important to note that COVID-induced enrollment decline is not occurring evenly across the board as the pandemic uh, appears to have differently impacted different uh, student subpopulations. Comments provided by the survey respondents suggest that students from the categories listed on this slide tended to enroll at significantly lower rates in fall 2020 compared to previous years. Biggest drop uh, based on the feedback 
is was occurring among the new, especially first time uh, students. Now, for a minute, let's shift from the survey findings to preliminary analysis of uh, hard data from the SACS COC annual enrollment profiles that were submitted uh, a few months ago. Um, and as you can see, overall SACS COC institutions had a net loss of approximately 3 to 4% in student FTEs in fall 2020 compared to fall 2019. In general, this is a somewhat moderate decline. However, an important question is in what segments did most significant enrollment drops occur? As you can see, level five and level six institutions, that's our doctoral granting uh, schools, did not generally experience any negative impacts of COVID-19 on their enrollment. It appears that the enrollment loss occurred primarily in track A institutions, generally community colleges and liberal arts colleges with only undergraduate programs. With level one schools losing between 10 and 12% of their overall enrollments and level two schools losing between seven and 9% of their student FTEs. Significant enrollment losses in the two year uh, sector confirm uh, survey findings that pandemic has had a negative impact on enrollment of new students, as well as low income and adult learners. Returning back to the survey, uh, when asked whether the pandemic is likely to impact student learning and completion, most commonly respondents said no. Uh, they do not believe uh, that the pandemic is likely to have any substantial negative or positive uh, effects uh, on student learning uh, outcomes or timely uh, credential completion. Another common response, however, was that it is too early to know, especially since in many institutions, uh, outcomes assessment activities were canceled or paused uh, last spring, spring 2020, or changed significantly in the content uh, format and administration in the fall of 2020. So, so basically, we just don't know. Uh, don't have any hard evidence uh, about the impact of pandemic on student learning. Uh, in addition, some respondents keenly pointed out that the pandemic is likely to have different effects on different student subpopulations. With low income adult students and students enrolled in technical or clinical programs being most likely impacted in negative uh, ways. Obviously, future research is warranted in this area, especially at the educational program levels. Many institutions shifted to telework or implemented alternate work schedules in order to accommodate social distancing. Virtually all respondents uh, reported that uh, they moved uh, at least some of their staff to telework uh, uh, settings. Uh, we were interested in exploring whether the institutional leadership perceived any impact of telework on staff productivity. Most commonly, respondents noted that employees greatly appreciated the opportunity to telework and that remote work arrangements had little or no negative impact on productivity, at least as of fall 2020. There were also a number of keen observations that telework arrangements are likely to have different impact on productivity for different employee segments. As we look ahead in the post-pandemic future, it will be interesting to explore 
the extent to which telework uh, options will remain on campuses and for what categories of faculty and staff. Now, let's take a look at COVID's effects on institutional finances. As the pandemic unfolded, uh, budgets were hit with a double whammy as schools faced losses of projected revenues on one hand and unbudgeted expenses on another hand. Before we get to the numbers, it is important to note uh, here that uh, less than two thirds of respondent institutions were able to make estimates about the pandemic impact on finances. In other words, at least a third of respondents were not able to make these type of estimates. So the numbers on, on this slide uh, need to be interpreted with a great uh, caution. About a third, uh, so, so in terms of an anticipated uh, decrease in revenues, that's uh, this side of the screen, the left side of the screen. Uh, we can see that about a third of sex C member institutions in, uh, among the respondents estimated no or only a moderate revenue loss of less than 5% due to COVID. So 33% uh, of respondents said, yeah, uh, the, 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 the COVID uh, had some impact, but the impact was very minimal on our revenue streams. Compare with the Tennessee, uh, we have here more than half of Tennessee respondents indicated no on minimal impact of the pandemic on their revenue streams. Another third of sex OC schools reported a more significant loss of revenues due to COVID, uh, between 5 and 10% uh, drop in revenues. And another third of sex OC schools and about one fifth of Tennessee institutions experienced a very uh, substantial uh, revenue uh, loss of more than uh, 10%. In fact, we have 5% uh, in the among uh, uh, sex UC respondents uh, who reported 25% or more uh, revenue loss uh, due to COVID. When we look at the right hand side uh, of the slide, here we have uh, data on estimated increase due to COVID. And as you can see, uh, more than uh, half of sex OC schools, 57% reported no or only modest less than 5% increase in expenditures due to the pandemic. However, almost all or 90% of Tennessee respondents fell in this category. About a quarter of sex use institutions experienced a moderate increase in COVID related expenditures in the amount between 5 and 10%. And alarmingly, uh, one fifth of sex use schools had to significantly increase expenditures by more than 10% while responding to COVID challenges. In general, it appears, appears uh, that the pandemic had a smaller effect on finances in Tennessee institutions than the commission overall. However, as I mentioned, not all schools were able to make financial estimates. And this made uh, a relatively small sample of 39 Tennessee schools even smaller on these particular survey items. Further, different institutions in different states with different governance control, public versus private, at different levels, community colleges, research universities, all of them used somewhat different accounting procedures to record, allocate, 
and then apply millions of dollars in federal and state COVID emergency aid. This might have skewed this data. And this kind of the, 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 the differences in accounting for for emergency aid uh, received from the federal government, from the states, really complicates our current ability to accurately capture the true impact of the pandemic on institutional finances. Thus, again, please interpret the numbers on this slide with great caution. And hopefully we will have a better understanding of these uh, financial matters when institutions uh, submit their official annual financial profiles next year. These slides list uh, major categories of unbudgeted expenses, uh, as well as key areas of revenue loss. Uh, the, the major unbudgeted expense was the investments made, uh, forced investments uh, made in IT and distance education infrastructure. That included uh, purchasing new equipment, upgrading institutional learning management systems, such as Blackboard, uh, purchasing uh, online conference uh, applications, such as Zoom, uh, as well as uh, purchasing specialized software, uh, for example, for virtual uh, uh, labs. Another big expense uh, related to managing and uh, containing COVID uh, on campuses, cleaning supplies, testing, tracing, and so on. Another big expense was uh, in retrofitting facilities, uh, refurbishing uh, for social distancing, for hybrid uh, delivery, and so on. Uh, many institutions, especially private residential uh, institutions, had to issue refunds uh, for housing, for meals, student activities uh, last spring. And finally, instit some institutions had to invest in additional pers personnel uh, because you need additional staff to teach smaller class uh, sections. You need additional personnel to administer tests and trace uh, COVID, as well as additional staff to ensure proper uh, cleaning of uh, facilities, as well as additional staff to provide IT support. Uh, on the revenue loss, uh, the primary uh, uh, category was uh, declines in tuition and fees revenues. In addition, several states uh, implemented holdbacks or budget cuts for public institutions. Many institutions, especially private institutions, uh, reported uh, significant uh, loss of revenues in terms of housing revenues, food service revenues, uh, facility rentals revenues, and so on. And finally, uh, some institutions reported uh, loss of revenues in terms of uh, donors and sponsored uh, research. Despite the double whammy effect of the COVID pandemic on institutional finances, uh, most schools appear to have been able, at least up to this point, to generally balance their budgets to a varying uh, extent. First and foremost, by utilizing emergency loan and grant funding made available by the CARES Act type federal and state aid. In fact, respondents repeatedly stated that the CARES Act was a true lifeline to their students and their institutions, especially uh, in the late spring and summer 2020. Second, uh, many institutions realized unanticipated savings with travel being canceled, uh, with utilities and office supplies minimized due to telework, and with some campus services suspended or canceled, uh, especially in spring and summer 2020. Thirdly, although CARES Act and subsequent aid packages did provide substantial support, 
many colleges still had to make significant operational adjustments by implementing strict purchasing controls and freezes, postponing capital projects and deferring maintenance, in some cases drawing on reserves and endowment funds, and very commonly by making personnel related adjustments. Specifically, personnel adjustments commonly focused on restricting or freezing hiring and keeping vacant positions unfilled. This, in fact, appears to be the most common strategy uh, related to personnel. Many institutions also promoted early retirement uh, programs, uh, but at the same time, some schools reduced or suspended contributions to retirement plans. Further, a number of institutions were forced to implement salary raised restrictions or in some cases make salary reductions. In addition, institutions had to reclassify some positions, for example, from, from full-time to part-time. Finally, approximately between a quarter and a third of respondent institutions had to furlough uh, or lay off uh, some personnel, especially in late spring, summer 2020. Typically, these were part-time instructors uh, and staff in some auxiliary and student support services. Given these challenges, uh, we were also interested uh, in learning whether institutions anticipate that COVID pandemic would have any negative effects on institutions' ability to maintain compliance with sex COC principles of accreditation. We were very pleased uh, that almost uniformly Respondents indicated that as of fall 2020, they did not expect the pandemic to impact their compliance status. Nevertheless, uh, respondents did ask for additional guidance from the Commission. Outcomes assessments and other institutional effectiveness items appear at the top of the list. And that's not just because assessment is a perennial uh, area uh, of concern, uh, but also because some institutions, as I have already mentioned, paused program assessment activities, especially last spring and summer, or implemented new very different assessment approaches in the online instruction settings in fall 2020. So, so that's a big reason why outcomes assessment, special programs, program outcomes assessment is, uh, is such, uh, uh, such highly rated on this particular item. Similarly, the dramatic shift to uh, virtual instruction uh, brings educational policies, uh, student support services, and institutional representation in terms of substantive change to the top of the list. And as we discussed a few minutes ago, uh, finance is another important area in which institutions uh, request more guidance. When uh, we uh, take a look at the respondents from Tennessee uh, institutions, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we see a somewhat higher levels of uh, general anxiety than the overall sex UC membership. And we can see that Tennessee representatives are especially looking for additional guidance related to student achievement, achievement and outcomes assessment, finances, as well as academic and student support services. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to visit, visit COVID uh, page on the SACCOC website and review posted materials. 
especially three position, uh, position statements on economic uh, or financial impact, educational quality, and institutional effectiveness and assessment during pandemic. I know uh, it's the, it is difficult to, to read this slide, um, but beyond the survey, now again, we kind of move away from the survey for a minute, uh, we are also interested in exploring whether the pandemic uh, had, has had an impact on the work of sex COC review committees and non-compliance findings. What you see on the screen is a summary of non-compliance data from off-site reviews that were conducted for institutions in reaffirmation classes of 2019, 2020, and 2021. As you know, off-site reviews take place twice a year in spring and fall. When we look at the class of 2021, that's the third column on the screen, track A off-site review was done in March, May 2020 and was based on pre-pandemic materials, but the actual review was conducted during the pandemic and the actual off-site review was held virtually. Track B off-site review for the class of 2021 was conducted in September, November 2020 and was based on materials that institutions finalized and submitted in the midst of the pandemic. And the review was also held virtually. So when we look at this data, uh, uh, it appears that there are no significant differences in terms of non-compliance patterns between off-site reviews that were conducted pre-pandemic, classes of 19 and 20, the first two columns on this uh, on the slide, and reviews done during the pandemic uh, for class of 2021. That's the third column uh, on the screen. In fact, the overall trend uh, of decreasing non-compliance rates continued for the class of 2021 that was again reviewed in the COVID-19 pandemic environment. As you can see, an average number of off-site findings of non-compliance per institution dropped from 15.6 uh, for class 2019 to 14.2 for class of 2020, and it continued dropping to 13.9 for class of 2020. 21. Again, there appears to be no uh, uh, significant uh, impact uh, of the pandemic on the findings of non-compliance uh, for the committees that were conducted uh, during the pandemic. Again, uh, I think we have some time uh, to, to pause uh, for a, a few minutes and see if there are any questions. So we, we do have a question. And do we know why level one and two institutions lost more students as compared to levels three through six? Are there takeaways we can, we can all learn as related to that specifically as it pertains to student support needs? Uh, first of all, uh, the, this uh, finding actually reflects almost identically the national findings. I think nationally, uh, community colleges also lost approximately 11% in the enrollments. Uh, one of the reasons uh, is technical. Uh, when you look at the two-year colleges, uh, the new students might account up to 50% of their whole population. Right? 
if everyone graduates in, in two years in, in, in ideal situation. So it's technically the, the, the proportion of new students in the overall uh, student population is larger uh, in, in uh, two year uh, institutions. Uh, and, and I think uh, evidence is clearly building that uh, there was a significant drop in enrollment of new uh, students, especially first time students. And that's affected the uh, traditional liberal, liberal arts colleges too. Uh, the, the, the second issue, I think more substantive that we can address is that uh, community colleges uh, enroll a large number of low income and adult students. Uh, they, they enroll students with families uh, that had to focus attention on providing uh, care to their children. Uh, so so, so I, I think that's kind of a combination of two, two, two issues, the, the drop among uh, enrollment of new students and the drop in enrollment uh, in adult and low income students that led to 11% drop in enrollment for community colleges. Thank you. And one more question that we have is, will the virtual offsite committee work still continue? Uh, the plan is to move to face-to-face, uh, -to, -face to, to regular uh, committee visits uh, starting this fall. Got it. Also, is the revenue inclusive or exclusive of CARES Act funding? That was the problem that uh, I, I, I mentioned that it's we need to uh, exercise a great caution looking at those financial numbers because some institutions did include it in the revenue. Some institutions did not include it in the revenue numbers. Uh, so, so, so again, there is significant variations is how institutions accounted for that those millions in aid. We have 780 institutions and there are possibly 780 ways that institutions uh, accounted for, for those uh, funds. Um, and, and, and then again, there are differences by private and public accounting procedures uh, in some uh, state systems uh, handled a big portion of uh, those funds. Uh, so we, we, we need to be careful interpreting their the finance numbers. Thank you. And we do have one more. Is the total revenue an expense change or simply a line item? Let me repeat that. Is the total revenue an expense change or simply a line item? For example, sports scan. I'm not sure if I can understand the question. Okay. Uh, I, I think yes. When when we in, in the survey we asked about revenues and uh, and expenditures as a one big bulk item. That is, we do not necessarily ask for uh, sub lines uh, or line items within these categories. Uh, Thank you. And we do have one more if you want to take that one at this time. Uh, yes, let, let's let's do it. I think we okay. uh, we have some time. Got it. Did SACS COC ever get any indication from U.S. Department of Ed if the virtual site visits would need to be redone with an in-person site visit now that things are opening back up? Uh, that would be a good question to the vice president assigned to your institution, but uh, my understanding that, uh, yes, uh, uh, in-person visits uh, will need to be done after the virtual visits. However, those uh, in-person visits are, uh, mostly will be done by just one person, typically the committee chair. But Thank again, you. that's a good que question for, for your vice president. Thank you so much. And I believe right now we're caught up on the question. So. All Back right.
So as the pandemic has been evolving, uh, survey respondents identified numerous challenges to keeping physical uh, campuses safely open and to offering quality educational experiences in virtual or hybrid settings. Regarding the physical campus, the most common challenge noted by survey res respondents, and remember that was in fall 2020, was enforcing uh, social distancing rules, especially among students in residence halls and other social settings. Respondents repeatedly discussed COVID fatigue, uh, politicization of mask wearing, as well as inconsistent messages from government officials. Another frequently mentioned uh, challenge was refurbishing facilities uh, for social distancing as well as hybrid instructional delivery. Related challenge is ensuring that facilities are frequently and deeply cleaned. In addition, uh, COVID symptom screening and tracing procedures are very complex in operation. And many respondents uh, repeatedly noted that uh, screening and tracing require continuous investment of significant human and financial resources. Finally, uh, COVID outbreaks on campus and consequent quarantines were disruptive and often caused significant logistical nightmares. As for the challenges in virtual hybrid uh, environment, uh, respondents frequently mentioned persistent digital divide issues related to technology access, especially for low income and rural students. Also providing appropriate technology training and continuous support uh, to students, faculty and staff remains an ongoing challenge and important task on many campuses. Further, uh, respondents repeatedly discussed potential negative impacts of prolonged virtual instruction on the levels of student engagement in learning processes. Some uh, respondents also voiced concern about ensuring integrity in student online work. In addition, uh, respondents pointed out challenges of effectively converting lab and other performance-based uh, uh, course experiences in virtual instruction. Further, a number of respondents noted that constant cognitive and behavioral shifts associated with hybrid instruction might lead to faculty burnout in the long run. Some respondents uh, also discussed challenges of moving advising, uh, tutoring, and other traditionally high personal touch support services to online platforms and converting face-to-face -face student activities to comparable experiences in virtual settings. Finally, uh, several respondents noted a growing disconnected feeling on campuses as many classes continue to be offered online and many staff members uh, were still teleworking. As we look forward, uh, there are several things that are clearly emerging on the horizon beyond these survey findings. First, the issue of vaccination for students, faculty and staff will be high on the agenda in the coming months. Do we encourage vaccination? Do we require vaccination? Do we provide vaccination on campus? Do we partner with the community partners? How will we handle booster shorts? And so on. But vaccination uh, will be high uh, on the agenda in the coming months. Second, uh, COVID-19 uh, made it clear that pandemic provisions need to be comprehensively included in campus safety or emergency or risk management or disaster recovery plans, as well as insurance contracts. 
Third, institutional researchers need to engage in studies to determine effects, if any, of the pandemic as well as associated campus actions on student learning outcomes, timely credential completion, and faculty and staff productivity. Fourth, uh, based on emerging anecdotal evidence, uh, it is likely that students would want expanded virtual learning options such as HyFlex to continue post pandemic. How would schools balance student demand for such flexible online options on one hand and faculty burnout as well as scheduling logistics challenges on another hand? On a related note, uh, institutions have made very substantial investments in distance education, infrastructure, equipment, classroom, refurbishing, faculty and staff development. An important emerging question is how will these investments be utilized in the long term perspective? Further, uh, with uh, decreased revenues, increased expenditures, and influx of billions of federal aid dollars, institutions need to carefully account for budget complexities in order to accurately assess their current financial health and to capture the impact of the pandemic uh, on the long-term financial stability. Also, institutions that are now preparing for decennial reaffirmation or fifth year interim uh, reviews might find it helpful to include focused, succinct uh, write-ups of COVID-19 effects and campus actions in relevant sections of compliance certification reports, such as program assessment, uh, faculty development, student support services, finance, and so on. Finally, as the Commission plans to re resume in-person committee visits uh, later this year, institutions are encouraged to work closely with SECCOC staff as well as committee chairs to ensure safe and productive reviews. Given serious challenges posed by the pandemic and current uncertainties on one hand, and significant advances uh, in vaccine administration on another hand, it is not surprising that higher education has started pondering about uh, the post-pandemic world. How will the higher education landscape look in the future? Interestingly, uh, Despite significant uh, disruptions that our institutions have been experiencing in the last 14 months or so, only 2% of survey respondents uh, believe that institutions will not be able to return uh, to pre-pandemic ways of operations in key teaching, learning, and administrative functions. About a half of respondents do expect permanent changes to take hold, but only in some areas. And at the same time, another half uh, believe that institutions will be able to return to pre-pandemic ways of operations in most educational and administrative functions. And as you can see, there are virtually no differences between projections made by Tennessee respondents and the overall SEC membership. Finally, uh, as you can see, a substantial majority or 84% of uh, SEC respondents believe that their own institutions will emerge in the post-pandemic world in a stronger state than they were before the advent of COVID-19. 
19. Interestingly, Tennessee respondents appear to be slightly less optimistic and more uncertain about the future than the sex COC membership overall. But still, there, are, there appears to be a very, very high degree of confidence and optimism. Respondents repeatedly indicated that although disruptions caused by the pandemic were unwelcome and at many times painful, these changes have made the institutions nimbler and more resilient. So as campus communities begin to gradually shape post-pandemic world, uh, let's work to channel this strong optimism and confidence into better student learning outcomes, uh, higher staff productivity, and more effective and efficient college operations. So I believe now we have a few minutes uh, to uh, for uh, questions and answers. Thank you so much. We do have one question right now. Did any survey respondents voice concerns regarding new emerging responsibilities related to students' psychological or emotional health? Uh, yes, but it did not trace to the top of the list. Uh, but again, remember that was a survey, survey was done in early fall uh, 2020. Uh, I believe these concerns uh, would be much higher on the list right now after the whole year of uh, hybrid or online instruction. Thank you. Additionally, when will the updated top 10 reaffirmation findings be posted on the SACS COC website? When we complete postponed committee visits for the class of 2020. Uh, so, so uh, unfortunately, as you know, the a, a number of uh, committee visits uh, were rescheduled for these on-site committee visits were rescheduled to uh, to spring, and it means that the CNR or the final stage of reviews for those institutions will be taking place in December. So before the cycle is completed, we will not be able to post that information. So, so the earliest this would be for class 2020, uh, February, March of the next year. However, we will be posting that offsite information that I shared with you uh, a few minutes ago, uh, probably in a couple of weeks. Because offsite, uh, offsite reviews continued. Uh, because they were done uh, virtually and the plan uh, for off sites, at least at this point, to continue them virtually uh, in, in the future. Just Thank off you. sites. Thanks. Are there any intentions to have a follow up survey? Uh, probably we will. Uh, 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 we have not discussed it yet, but probably we will uh, be doing a follow up uh, survey, but it will be much more focused and narrower in scope than the survey we, we, we had uh, last fall. Um, we are also uh, waiting for the annual uh, financial profiles to, to have a a uh, better understanding of the finance uh, information. Thank you. Is there any prelim preliminary data indicating how many institutions plan to continue teaching at, at pandemic levels in the online modality after the pandemic ends? Uh, no. no. Uh, we, 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 we can uh, say it will probably will be for at least 30% of students, because remember one of the slides we, we, we took a uh, look at, uh, at the pre-pandemic uh, levels of distance education engagement. And on average, we had 30% of students uh, in uh, sexual institutions were engaged either exclusively uh, online or at least for some courses. So at least 30%. 
uh, but it's probably will be much higher. Because again, I mentioned that based on the anecdotal evidence, uh, the students will be demanding expanded online options, such as high flex uh, course design. Uh, but on the other hand, as we uh, increasingly hear about high flex, it does lead to faculty burnout because you have to have this cognitive and behavioral shifts from online back to face to face and so on. Thank you. I don't see any more questions at this time, but we can maybe give the next 30 seconds to see if anyone wants to ask any questions. If not, we will move forward. Okay, well, Dr. McVeigh, we want to thank you for taking the time out to share this information from this um, survey that was conducted by SAC CLC. This is very um, helpful information um, that is shared, and I think among institutions and system levels, we can um, utilize the results to be beneficial as we continue to move on through higher education um, during these different times of living. I do um, want to share with the um, network and all participants today that the presentation will be shared on our website um, at the Tennessee Accreditation Network. You will find the URL listed here, but we will also send out an email um, to you all, the participants that were, that were registered for today to relay any of this information. Again, we do thank you for taking time out to join the Tennessee Education Commission and the Tennessee Accreditation, Accreditation Network. And we do hope to provide you additional resources and webinars of this nature that will continue to guide us as we uh, matriculate through the higher education journey together. Again, it's been a pleasure and we're so glad to have you join us. Take care and have a great rest of the day.